Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs here. Uh, today I want to talk about um, iodine deficient, deficiency, so excuse me, and the warning signs of iodine deficiency. And we'll talk about how it affects your thyroid, um, how to know if you are deficient or how to suspect if you are deficient, and how to how to supplement with iodine. Um, so let's let's jump right in. So first of all, as you probably know, and I won't spend too much time on this, but iodine is critical. It's required for the um, creation of thyroid hormone. So you probably know a little bit about T4, a little bit about T3. These are the, the most biologically active thyroid hormones. And the reason they're called T4 and T3 is because that is the amount of iodides that each of these hormones has. So T4 has four iodides and T3 has three iodides. So um, basically what happens is depending on the enzymes that they come into contact with, your body will basically cut off these iodides and it will either activate or inactivate depending on which part of the thyroid molecule it, it comes into contact with. So um, basically you can't have thyroid hormone if you don't have sufficient iodine because you just won't be able to incorporate that into the thyroid hormone. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, that's, that's not really a complex topic. Um, the complexity comes when we talk about deficiency of iodine. And so here's here. Let me just lay out um, some of the concerns right away. So number one is the United States, and I'm specifically speaking about the United States here, um, but this is probably relevant to other developed countries. Um, that is, these places are known as iodine replete, replete locations, and the the reason that they're called that is because the governments have usually um, made recommendations regarding um, placing certain amounts of iodine into into foods and, um, and and things like that so you probably are familiar with iodinated salt what that means is the salt has been created and iodine has been put inside of the salt and the reason for that is we know people use salt and so if you use salt then you're going to be getting iodine now you might say well why do you have to why do you even have to do that and the reason is Iodine is actually fairly difficult to get. Um, the only way that humans get iodine is through their diet. So that means, well, we'll come to that in a second. So you can only get it through your diet, and you only get it through certain foods. And those foods are foods that Americans tend to not eat very frequently, such as sea vegetables, kelp, um, and things like that. So when was the last time, I mean, you, you can answer this um, internally, but when was the last time you had kelp or seaweed? The answer is probably not frequently, and if you do have it, it, maybe it's with sushi or something like that. So you can imagine a scenario in which humans, are they require iodine to be consumed in their diet, and yet the only place that we're getting it from, which is sea vegetables, is not a, doesn't make a, or is not a regular part of our diet. So obviously, there's this high opportunity or high chance that many people are iodine deficient. And that used to be the case. Um, I can't remember the time frame on this, but there was um, lots of people with what is called goiter, um, and that's a thyroid condition, which is just an enlargement of your thyroid gland, and there were tons of people that had goiters. And then it was connected, uh, uh, doctors or scientists connected the, the presence of goiter with iodine deficiency, and then they said, oh, here we go. Let's, let's put iodine in foods, and then we'll take away the goiter. And that worked. Okay, it worked. Um, however, so we have a lot of lot of competing interests here. But however, so even though the 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 incidence of goiter has decreased, the incidence of Hashimoto's has increased. So it seems to be that consumption of iodine, somehow, some way, and we'll talk about this a little later, um, is required in some amount. However, too much con too much or excessive consumption of iodine increases your risk for another thyroid disease called Hashimoto's thyroiditis which is an autoimmune thyroid disease so you really have sort of this this complexity here um, to make it uh, to make it more um, complicated studies have shown that the amount of iodine that people are consuming even in the last 10 years from iodinated sources is decreasing okay do I have a graph on here um, no, it looks like I don't. But anyway, there is a graph from studies which show that, uh, you know, every year since the year 2000, the, the average intake from the 70s to now um, has decreased. So people used to consume, let's say, 200 micrograms or, of iodine per day, and now that's down to like 110. And we'll talk about the actual amount that you need. 
Um, before I do that, let's talk about just a couple of other basics here. So your body holds around 15 to 20 milligrams MGs of iodine in total. Of that total amount, about 70% is stored in your thyroid gland. So this is the reason that radioactive iodine destroys your thyroid gland because your body, if we give you iodine, um, it'll, it'll take it and the majority of it will go to the thyroid and it'll be stored there. So if we irradiate that iodine, it's going to be taken up and that's going to destroy your thyroid gland. So that's just a, a little bit of a, um, a side note there on how that works. So um, anyway, a large amount, 15 to 20 milligrams um, of iodine is stored in your body. 70% of that is stored in the thyroid gland. And your body takes from that store about 150 micrograms per day. That's not milligrams, okay? So 1,000 micrograms equals 1 milligram. So you have about 15 thousand to twenty thousand micrograms of iodine total and your body takes from that store about 150 per day okay and that's to be used now around 120 of that is used by the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone which means if you're doing math here then about 30 micrograms is used up in other tissues in your body so here's another important point and that is more than just your thyroid needs iodine okay so this this comes into play when we talk about the symptoms of iodine deficiency so what's interesting is that your body has um, what I call a built-in mechanism or storage capacity to help buffer against iodine deficiency because we know, and you probably know this, that you're not consuming about 150 micrograms of iodine per day. We already talked about why that is. Um, actually, I didn't mention one other important point, which I will talk about now, and that is that Many people now, especially if you're listening to this, these those these so-called health-conscious um, uh, people in the United States, they don't consume regular iodinated salt. What do they use instead? Himalayan pink salt or Celtic sea salt, right? They usually use these things. Um, and these are not necessarily high in iodine, like iodinated salt is. So if you're not, if you're avoiding iodinated salt, you're not eating seaweed or kelp or anything like that, then there's a high chance that you're just not getting iodine. Um, and that means you have to get it from some other source. So that's a side note here. Let's go back to what we were talking about. So the body has a built-in mechanism to help buffer against a deficiency. So you use 150 micrograms and your body has a, the ability to store about 15 to 20,000 micrograms, not milligrams, micrograms, in case some days you don't need it. You don't need as much as you need to, right? So you can go a day without eating um, kelp, you know, and you can go three days or something and you'll be okay because your body will just draw from that store. And then when you presumably you you eat uh, the food that's high in iodine, you build back that store. And so this is how the body kind of works in cycles. Now, um, the problem is that that works, but then what happens when you deplete that store, okay? What happens, and we know from studies that many people out there are consuming um, decreasing amounts of iodine and the consumption, the amount that they're required, that their body is required to use, that doesn't go down. That is constantly staying the same. So if you're not eating as much and you're consuming the same amount, eventually you'll run into this deficiency. So um, basically, most physicians believe that because we are in a quote unquote iodine replete environment, that iodine deficiency is really not something that we see nowadays. And what I'm trying to suggest here through all of this information is that that may not be true for a lot of people. There may be a significant amount of people that are walking around um, and they are, let's just say, they have suboptimal levels of iodine in which they're getting some iodine from their diet but not sufficient to meet the demands in their body, which means that they have some deficiency there. And that deficiency is manifesting as well, some of the symptoms we'll talk about, but specifically as hypothyroidism. So let's talk about let's talk about some of those symptoms. So we already listed one previously, and that is goiter formation. So goiter is a generally just a very non-specific term. It just means that the thyroid gland is enlarging; it's getting bigger, and it doesn't necessarily. Um, the, the term doesn't say why, but we know that one of the causes of goiter formation is iodine deficiency. Now the good news is um, if you give somebody who has a goiter secondary to iodine, if you just, iodine deficiency, if you just give them iodine, the goiter just completely goes away. So it, in, in this way, it's probably some sort of protective mechanism that your body has. And, you know, as it struggles to produce thyroid hormone and it can't, it may just enlarge to try and increase that capacity. But of course, if you're iodine deficient, well, you can't, you can't produce it, right? Because we just said that iodine is required for thyroid hormone. Okay. So that's one symptom. Now, goiter is generally asymptomatic. You don't really feel it, but it is a, it is a sign of, of potentially of iodine deficiency. It's, it's often 
um, found through physical exam by your doctor, or you may just notice that your neck just seems bigger. And you're like, what is the deal? Generally, it doesn't hurt. Generally, it's not really associated with symptoms unless it gets very big. Um, so it's generally asymptomatic in that way. However, um, if uh, one of the other set of symptoms that we're going to talk about associated with, with um, iodine deficiency um, would be the cascade of symptoms associated with hypothyroidism. Now, let's just, let's just iron this out so you understand. Remember, I said if you're iodine deficient, you're unable to produce thyroid hormone, okay? So thyroid, a deficiency in thyroid hormone, well, that is, by definition, what hypothyroidism is, and that's a pretty serious disease. So all of the symptoms that are associated with hypothyroidism may potentially be associated with iodine deficiency. Do you see the connection there? So what am I talking about in terms of symptoms here? Fatigue weight gain, hair loss, muscle pain, cold intolerance, low body temperature, infertility, high cholesterol, menstrual irregularities, and on and on and on. Now I have a full list of um, symptoms that you can that you can look at here. Let this load. Um, there's a bunch down here that you can go through. Tons and tons of symptoms. So you can go through here and do a checklist if you want. This, these are the symptoms associated with hypothyroidism, and they also tend to follow the symptoms associated with iodine deficiency because they're connected in that way. Another big issue is developmental issues in young kids and children. So you have to have iodine for proper brain development. Um, and this is, I mean, it makes sense, but this is more important for kids who are younger because their brain is developing. When you're adult and you have um, iodine deficiency, you may experience symptoms like brain fog and mood disorders and things like that. But it's not quite as bad as it is with kids because we know that decreased iodine intake in children is associated with a lower IQ in some populations. Now that's a big deal. The reason is IQ can't necessarily be changed. So the most sensitive time um, in, a, in a child's life in terms of their, their brain is during the developmental stages. And so if you, if you don't have sufficient iodine during that time, well, then that might result in permanent negative consequences for that child moving on. Now, compare that to an adult. Like I said, it's not gonna, it may temporarily affect their IQ because they're unable to concentrate. But once you give them iodine, they get back to whatever it is that they were before. But if you permanently disrupt the way that a, ch a child's brain is developing, well, then that's something that you might not be able to re reverse. Okay, does that make sense? That's kind of the issue. Um, so for that reason, it's so, so, so important for, to make sure that your kids are getting sufficient amount of um, iodine because they, they need that amount. And like I said, accidentally, these health conscious adults may be um, not providing enough iodine to, to their children, not, not intentionally, but just accidentally because they're not providing those sort of processed foods that tend to have iodine in it. Okay, next set um, is pregnancy-related problems. So iodine deficiency is, is associated with miscarriage, preterm delivery, and then, of course, the congenital abnormalities, which we talked about. So the, the, the developing fetus requires iodine to, to develop the brain, and then children, once they're born, their brain is, is malleable, and it's, you know, growing, and, and neurons are, you know, it's plastic, and neurons are being created and whatnot. But so there's two different sort of um, issues there. So you have the children, then you have the, the fetus um, and, and the, the uh prior to birth. Um, but the point is, during pregnancy, iodine plays a critical role. Um, the next one is the connection between iodine deficiency and fibrocystic breast disease, and then of course, breast cancer. So um, iodine is felt to be somewhat protective um, as a agent against breast cancer, um, and especially cysts. So if you're somebody that has fibrocystic breast disease, um, there's a probability that that might be caused at least in part by iodine deficiency. The good news is that taking iodine in that setting usually completely eliminates the problem. So it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, the other thing is cystic acne. So pretty much if, you, if you're kind of getting the idea here, fibrocystic breast disease, cystic acne. So iodine deficiency results in these cyst formation and just create cysts in areas of the body that are deficient in iodine. Okay. So um, in this case, it's on your skin. And previously we were discussing where the cysts form in the breast. So um, that's one way to think about it. Now, um, this acne is also a side effect of hypothyroidism. So you, you have to kind of tease out what, it, what is causing it. It's not quite as simple as saying, you know, all acne is iodine deficiency. That, that's not what I'm saying at all. However, that may be playing a role. Um, so who is at risk for developing iodine deficiency? Now, I just said a lot of people are because of their diet. Now, we already, we already know that. We've talked about it. But there are other conditions which increase your risk for developing iodine deficiency as well because they alter the way that your body is using it, okay? So you can either block the absorption. So let's say you're consuming enough iodine 
That's not enough, though. The iodine has to get into your thyroid gland. So what if you're consuming something like a goitrogen, which blocks the uptake into the thyroid gland? So in this way, you can be consuming an adequate amount through your diet, but it's just not making it into the thyroid gland. And then there are other um, conditions which increase the amount of iodine that your body requires. So basically, what, what it's, it's, like a, it's like a machine, and it's revving up the amount of production of whatever the machine is producing. And so you're, you have to use more iodine in certain situations. So we'll talk about both of these. So um, certain conditions that fit into this category include smoking, tobacco use in particular, is associated with goiter formation um, through through several mechanisms, but um, you can click on those and read through those. I won't I won't talk on those um, very much right now. Um, um, perhaps a more important one is exposure to environmental factors uh, or environmental factors, especially halides. So these are certain types of um, chemicals that that share um, similar electron formations in their outer shells, and they all fit on the same line in the periodic table, and they have an affinity for um, binding where iodide, iodide would bind as well. So in this way, they might be competing with iodine um, and inactivating some of your thyroid hormone. And then another important one to discuss is the consumption of goitrogenic foods and chemicals. Now, I've already done a video on goitrogens, so it's worth going back to discuss those. Um, but there are different types of goitrogens, and what these things do is they block the uptake of iodine into the thyroid gland. So like I said, there are situations in which you may be consuming enough iodine. You may be consuming iodine repleted or, or iodinated salt or, or sea, sea vegetables, kelp, et cetera, seaweed. Um, but it doesn't matter because it's not getting in to your thyroid gland to be utilized. Okay. Now, conditions in which the amount of iodine that your body needs increases would be um, pregnancy and breastfeeding. Okay. So those are both very important conditions because you need about double what you would normally. So a, so a normal adult would need somewhere around 150 micrograms of iodine per day. Now, somebody who is, is pregnant needs anywhere between 250 and 290. So it's generally recommended that those women take, I would say, at least 300 micrograms. And this, by the way, this should be done before you're pregnant, okay? So if you're trying to conceive, then you, it's a good idea to start taking iodine um, before that because you never want to be in a suggestion. Well, let's just put it this way. You generally don't know you're pregnant until you've already been pregnant for several weeks. Well, what's happening during that time? Well, things are still happening to the fetus during that time. You just may not be aware of it. That's why they recommend that pregnant women or women trying to conceive take folic acid. Not when they're pregnant, but certainly when they're pregnant. They prefer that you do it before you're pregnant because with folic acid, by the time you know you're pregnant, it's almost too late to go back and start supplementing. So same thing with iodine. Okay, keep that in mind. Um, I won't go into too much about supplementing with iodine um, right now, but it, it's fairly straightforward. You really only want to be supplementing with it if you are deficient. Um, I recommend that you, if possible, you find natural food sources of iodine. The reason for that is it comes with other nutrients. Okay, When you supplement with iodine, you're only getting iodine, generally. You know, sometimes it comes with other things, but um, you really need to be getting it with the whole array of other nutrients which are meant to be consumed with it. So if you can, get the food sources. If you can't, fine. Then you need, at minimum, 150 micrograms per day if you're not consuming it, or 200 to 300 if you're breastfeeding or lactating. Now, we're assuming that with these numbers that there is probably some amount that you're getting into your diet, whether you realize it or not. So most people, it's not like most people just get zero every single day. Instead, most people are probably getting, you know, 25 to 100 to based off the day. But that's insufficient if the demand is 150, okay? So in, in a lot of cases, you could still get by just supplementing with 100 per day and knowing that through the various foods that you eat, you're probably getting on average about 50 extra per day. So 100 plus 50 is 150 and you're set, unless of course you're pregnant. Um, the other thing is you really need to make sure that if you're going to supplement with iodine, you use zinc and selenium in combination with iodine um, because part of the reason, remember I said previously in the beginning of this, that, and this kind of goes into our next thing, which is supplementing with iodine dangerous. Well, remember we said that people that, populations that, um, where iodine has been added to certain foods, they reduce their risk of goiter, but at the same time, they increase their risk of Hashimoto's, okay? And this is a pretty, pretty I would say, um, known connection. Now, the, why it happens is a whole other story, but part of the reason why it may occur is because the, the supplementation with iodine in isolation, meaning by itself, is an unnatural way to supplement with any nutrient, right? How do we get these nutrients normally? 
Well, we get it when we consume food, which has more than just iodine inside of it. And so it may be that the reason people develop Hashimoto's um, when they just take iodine is because they are still deficient in other important nutrients such as zinc and selenium. So if you take iodine, and this is well established with studies, if you take iodine and you're selenium deficient, then it actually causes more problems into the gland, uh, the thyroid gland I'm talking about here. So if you can take iodine with selenium, with zinc, you, you have reduced and perhaps eliminated that risk of developing the autoimmune disease. So just remember, it's a balance of more than just one nutrient. We never want to look at the body um, and we never want to look at just one nutrient and say, well, what is this going to do if we put it in? Well, it doesn't work that way in, um, when you consume foods because you're consuming much more than just a single nutrient. Okay, so That's one of the reasons that these studies have to be looked at closely. Um, but is iodine supplementation dangerous? I would say generally not if it's done correctly. Um, some of the symptoms that you may be taking too much iodine include acne, restlessness, irritability, gastrointestinal effects such as diarrhea and insomnia. Um, that may just mean that you're taking too much too quickly or you're not taking it in combination with zinc and selenium. So just remember these things as you go through this process. Um, and that's pretty much it, guys. So uh, the bottom line is most healthy adults need about 150 micrograms per day, but pregnant and lactating women need 250 to 290 uh, micrograms of iodine per day. So make sure you're getting that amount. You can, like I said, get it through food if possible, but if you can't get it through food or for whatever reason, then you really need to be supplementing. There's no other way to get it. So um, that's it. Uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. I, I hope you guys found this one uh, this one helpful. Um, it's a really important topic, and I don't think one that gets enough attention, uh, to be perfectly honest. So leave any, any questions or comments below, and um, I'll do my best to answer each one.